Mechik Muhammad. Allah Akbar. Beautiful job. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Allow me to begin in the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I bear witness that there is no God except that Allah is God. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. We thank Allah and give to Allah praise and gratitude and deep and sincere appreciation. We thank Allah for all of his gifts, all of his blessings, all of his mercies, chief of which is that he blessed you and I to awaken from a night of rest, sleep, and slumber to behold a brand new day, proving the truth of that old colloquial saying in the black community that God is not through with me yet. We thank Allah for the precious and the irreplaceable gift of life. My teacher has taught me that after the gift of life, there is no greater gift that God would give to man and woman than the gift of the divine revelation of truth. That which we commonly refer to as scripture. But it is, in fact, guidance for life. And it customarily comes to a people through a prophet or a messenger. And we thank Allah for all of the prophets and all of the messengers. In Islam, we believe in them all, and we don't argue, fuss, and fight over which one was better than another. We believe in all of the prophets and the messengers of Allah, God. We thank Allah for Moses and the Old Testament or the Torah. We thank Allah for Jesus and the New Testament or gospel. And we thank Allah for Prophet Muhammad and the Holy Quran. We wish peace on all of Allah's worthy and his righteous servants. I am, however, eternally grateful and forever indebted to Allah for his divine and his merciful intervention into our affairs having appeared to us in the divine person of Master Fard Muhammad. We thank him for his coming and we thank him for his wise choice of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad to be his messenger, Messiah, and the exalted Christ. And we thank these two for the one that is among us today, who many of us have been blessed to touch the hem of his garment. And we now bear witness that we have been made whole. But he's been a brother to us, a friend to us, a noble example for us, a champion for us. Time and circumstances are revealing that for the past 40 plus years, he has functioned in the life of black people in America as a Messiah. I am, of course, referring to my teacher and yours, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Beloved brothers and sisters, allow me to greet you in the greeting words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum. I want to extend my appreciation to each of you for coming out to be with us today. I am happy and thrilled to be back in the great city of Washington, D.C. I'm always honored to be here, I always have a wonderful time and so far we've had a wonderful time. I don't know if you were here yesterday, but I had a good time yesterday. What about you? Part of what makes this 
trip so special for me as a student minister is the occasion and opportunity to spend time with my dear brother, a big brother, a friend, uh, a mentor from afar, but a man that has always been a stalwart defender and chief helper of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and that is his Mid-Atlantic Student Regional Minister, Abdul Qadir Mohammed. We thank a lot for him, and we thank a lot for all of the officials and the laborers and the brothers and sisters of the FOI and the MGT who do everything to make an event like this possible. You know, oftentimes you get a chance to see someone's name on a flyer, on a billboard or a marquee, and they're going to be at an event or somewhere doing whatever, and you don't get a chance to see the sometimes nameless and faceless men and women who make the event a success. So I want to extend my gratitude to all of the brothers and the sisters who have helped us and did everything as much as just open the door and give us a smile or give us the greetings. And I'm especially thankful to all of my brothers and sisters who may be with us today as guests or visitors. Some of us, uh, we may be trying to make up our mind, do we want to actually become a registered member of the nation? Because you know from our vantage point, you already are a member of the nation. However, membership does have its privileges once you get registered. So if I'm effective in doing what I came to do today, maybe I'll help you make that decision that I think I'm ready to stand with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So our subject today deals with the Messiah, the promised Messiah. Jehovah Hoover referred to a black Messiah. But this idea of Messiah is very important, and I think is all the more important for Black History Month. You know, Black History Month, we are introduced to so many prominent luminaries from the struggle of our people. And many times, black history is put within a secular frame and context. But as a student of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I see black history within the frame and the context of the divine. Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us of the divine nature and true identity of the black man and woman of America. I'd like to begin with a quote from our illustrious teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who states, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Allah God revealed to him that the black people of America are the real children of Israel and that they, we, are the choice of God and unto us he will deliver his promise. So our subject is the promised Messiah Come on. in Black History Month. Now, I don't ever like to get too far into any subject unless I define some terms. So I hope you don't mind me opening up the dictionary. Open it up, open it up, talk to us. Now, this word promise in English means an oral or written agreement to do or not to do something, a vow, an indication as of a successful prospect or future basis for expectation, something promised. Come on. When you see the word promise in the Quran, it normally comes from a root word, wa'ada, which means to promise, to give one's word, sometimes to threaten, to promise good. According to the context, the rendering is changed, either to promise or threatening. Talk to us. So we're talking about a promise. I know many times we don't like to hear promises because in our life's experience, many times folks make us a promise and they don't keep it. But you know, Allah never breaks his promise. Never, never. He never breaks his promise. And you can't really talk about this subject of Messiah without talking about God's promise to his people the one that the Bible and the Quran refers to as the real children of Israel. 
when Allah makes a promise to a people, again, he never breaks his promise. Now, I know that we have never really seen ourselves as the real children of Israel, and certainly Israel is in the news. You can hardly turn on TV without hearing something about Israel and the Palestinians and Gaza and all of this kind of stuff. And it can be something that will make you turn to another channel and watch the game or watch reruns of Martin. Depends on what you like. But you should know that the true identity of the children of Israel is the black man and woman of America. So your antenna should go up when they're talking about Israel and Gaza in the news. And I don't know if you've got your ticket. I don't know if you've got your hotel reservation. But at the end of this month, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's Savior's Day address in Detroit, he will be offering divine guidance into what you've been hearing about on the news. And we talked yesterday that in all of the talking heads and analysts and political figures and activists that have been lending their voice to the conflict in Gaza, mainstream media has noticed that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has been silent. And they literally wrote an article about the curious silence of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I said, man, that's something. Our minister's silence speaks louder than other folks' words. But at the end of this month, you don't have to worry and wonder what the minister thinks about this conflict. He's going to grace the rostrum at Savior's Day. So let me put in a plug for Savior's Day as we get into this message. If you have not decided whether or not you're going to be with us in Detroit, I hope you decide today to come and be with us. All praise is due to Allah. Let's look at what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has said. He says that this black people of America who have been swallowed symbolically by the white slave master and his children must now be brought out of this race of people and be taught the knowledge of their own. Allah is holding the affair in person in the name of Master Far Muhammad. He has chosen us today to be his people and establish forever a people of righteousness and a people with unlimited knowledge of the divine supreme being. The very last one of these will become greater than the greatest of this world. The orthodox Muslims will have to bow to the choice of Allah. Allah will bring about a new Islam as for the principles of belief, they remain the same. The promised Messiah in Black History Month. You can't talk about a Messiah without identifying who he is to come to. And over and over again, we see that there was almost a natural conflict inevitable to happen between a nation of Islam and certain members of the Jewish community because they say they are the children of Israel. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad insists that you are. That's your real divine identity. He goes on to say it like this. He says, the type of the so-called Negroes is given in many parables of the Bible. In fact, if the Bible is rightly understood, it is referring to none other than the so-called Negroes and their enemies. The chosen people of God to whom the God gave the firstborn convert and even the Mahdi Christ offered his life to restore the so-called Negroes again to their own kind. But the so-called Negroes are blinded with a picture of the Jews' salvation and cannot see their own selves in prophecy. They should shout with joy over the understanding that God has and is causing me to give them of the book. So all throughout black history, when you hear about folk like Jan Matziliger and Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, I want you to think about what is divine black history? What is black history according to the sacred texts of Jews and Christians and Muslims? Are we just the people that only have value and our history is only important based upon what we've done under the canopy of global white supremacy? But there's something in the Bible, there's something in the Quran 
about your and my history and more importantly our destiny that we want to talk about today. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the Pittsburgh Courier says the so-called Negroes of America are really God's choice to build the kingdom of peace on earth. The Negroes are the lost sheep of the Bible and not Israel. Now these are bold claims, but what becomes very convincing and compelling is when we're able to look at the actual lived experience of black people in America and draw relevant parallels to how God describes the condition of the children of Israel in scripture. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Well, you know the Bible says that the children of Israel were in bondage for 400 years. Talk to us. Talk to us. Now, Master Far Muhammad revealed to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that we first came to America in 1555. A lot of folks say it was 1619. Well, either view you take, we've been here 400 years at this point. 2019 gave you 400 years if that's your view. But Allah revealed to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad it was 1555, and modern historians acknowledge that an expedition under the command of John Locke reportedly returned to England with certain black slaves in 1555. So 1955 completes a period of 400 years. Yes, sir. Teach it. Teach it. Do you know that the leading scholars in Israel, some of them tenured professors at Tel Aviv University, they say that their own people do not fit the biblical description because they were never in bondage for 400 years. Right. Teach it, man. Teach it. You're the only people on the earth that were in bondage for 400 years. That's one of the major identifying characteristics of the children of Israel, this people to whom the Messiah would come from. Come All praises due to Allah. It says in Daniel 1 and 7, it talks about their names being changed. Certainly the historians acknowledge that the slaves had been stripped of their status, their names, their families and friends, and their customs and culture. If I ask the secretary to bring me the roster when you signed in today, I probably would see Mr. Johnson somewhere listed there, or Sister Smith, or Sister Williams. There's gonna be some Muhammads and some X's and some Shabazzes, but don't you think it's curious that all of the marching, all of the protests, all of the rallies that black folk have pursued, at no point in our history have we ever had a mass mobilization to say, we want our names back. We pursue jobs and justice and an end to police brutality, all worthy goals and causes. But you know, the Bible says a good name is better than gold. God says he would call his people by a new name. And if you were here yesterday, we talked about how when Master Farad Muhammad came to Detroit in the early 1930s, he started changing the names of all of those who came to follow him. And it caused a stir, it caused concern. And the clerks in Detroit in those years, they issued a policy. and said, no longer are we going to acknowledge these Muslim names given to Negro right, hmm? because that's a part and that's tied to you learning what your destiny is as the people of God. Moreover, the children of Israel, according to scripture, they were oppressed using a special extrajudicial legal system. In other words, there was laws for the masters and separate laws for the slaves. And you find this depicted in the book of Psalms where the psalmist cries out to God. Surely, God, do you mean you have a fellowship with this throne of iniquity that frames mischief by means of its laws? And so uh, in America, there was the American slave code. And believe it or not, all of the activities that we like to be involved in as civilized people they were deemed against the law. It was against the law to read. It was against the law for a black man to marry a black woman. Said slaves could not constitute families. 
we were forbidden from testifying in court. So through this slave code of laws, you, the modern, the real children of Israel, underwent the kind of oppression that the Bible foretells. Moreover, it talks about the children of Israel being robbed and spoiled. Now, some of you remember the crack epidemic. Some of us remember the so-called war on drugs. And we see today a stark contrast in how many of the white victims of the opioid epidemic are presented in a very compassionate manner and they recommend wraparound services and therapies and treatments because they are addicted to opiates. But when the little brothers and sisters who were the bright lights of the black community became victimized by crack and cocaine in the 80s and 90s, the philosophy was lock them up and throw away the keys. And the image of the dope fiend in America was a black face, a black brother, a black sister. Well, in the history, it says that we first got involved in cocaine due to plantation owners who learned that if they gave their slaves, their plantation workers, cocaine, that they would work longer and work harder. So you, they, they tried to make you and I think that we just are people that are just prone to drug addiction or drug abuse, substance abuse. But according to this study, it says employers in the South have made a practice of supplying their black workers with cocaine. Thus, they kept a steady supply on hand to increase productivity and keep workers content. Cocaine was also a cheap incentive to maintain control of workers, a people robbed and spoiled, see? And you have to think of these things, brother and sister, because sometimes we look at the condition of our people and we say, damn, man, we just crazy as you know what. But never forget there is a deliberate plan afoot to develop and nurture savage behavior in the black community because they use that to justify their evil mistreatment of us. So yes, they've put drugs in our community. That ain't some conspiracy theory as well documented at this point. And that's a part of that black history that they don't want in the public school system. So the governor in Florida and the governor in Arkansas, the governor in Arkansas famous, famously said, we don't want advanced African-American studies in our school system in Arkansas because it'll make students hate America. I said, wow, that's strange. Because for so many years, y'all blame the Nation of Islam for teaching hate. Now you're saying that just telling the unvarnished real truth about what happened to black people in America will produce hate? So you see now the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan were innocent all along. They just don't want you to know. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that the white man of America is possessed of the mind of Cain. Because after Cain killed Abel, the scripture says, and he thought within himself. Now every man that sees me will slay me. Well, Cain, you're a singular individual man. You can only be slain or killed once. What do you mean every man will slay you? It's put in the mouth of Cain the fear of retaliation of an entire people. They are deathly afraid of you ever learning the truth of what happened to us and who did it. So you go K through 12 and they hardly mention to you anything about what your people endured. Yet annually and sometimes every semester they expose little black children to histories of the Jewish Holocaust. And even though you may be the baddest gangster in the neighborhood, because of your indoctrination in school, 
there's a place of compassion and sympathy for the Jewish people installed in your thinking. But because you don't know that they took our names, because they don't teach anymore that they used to hang us from trees, that they used to castrate us and rape our mothers, they don't teach that no more. So you are not emerged into young adulthood never knowing anything about the struggle and the pain and the suffering of our people. And it causes us to be void of a necessary, a required compassion that we should have for one another. We are fellow sufferers. It don't matter if my brother's wearing red or my other brother's wearing blue. We are fellow sufferers. Beef is natural, conflict is natural, but it doesn't have to be resolved with violence. But if you don't have any knowledge of your people's shared suffering, the activities we're involved in in the streets, we begin to see one another as enemies. Do you know that right here in this city, at Howard University, former President Lyndon Bain Johnson, see, because it talked about the real children of Israel, you kill the male and spare the female. Listen to what he said at Howard. This is the president of the United States. He ain't a Nation of Islam minister. He's the president of America. He said the family breakdown, perhaps most important, its influence radiating to every part of life is the breakdown of the Negro family structure. For this, most of all, white America must accept responsibility. It flows from centuries of oppression and persecution of the Negro man. Teach it, man. Teach it. You teach it. Think over this now. It flows from the long years of degradation and discrimination which have attacked his dignity and assaulted his ability to produce for his family. Man, thinking, man. Oh, teaching, man. Kill the male, yes. spare the female. See? See, the book is all pointing to you. That's right. That's right. Hmm? right now, in the city that I come from and many other major cities, Homicide is the pandemic's biggest killer of young black men. Think over that. We're killing one another more than COVID-19 did. Mm. Hmm? Teach it, man. Because what was done to us mentally, emotionally, morally, spiritually has now caused us to become our own worst enemy. Hey, you teach it, man. Hmm? Come on, you teach it. The promised Messiah in Black History Month. The children of Israel, God made a promise to them. Mm-hmm. His promise that from them, through them, and for them, he would give birth to a Messiah. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting that most of the time we think of the Messiah as this genteel suffering kind of character that might not be too attractive, but particularly to men. Because there's none of us as men that don't want to be strong. Come on. There's none of us that are men that don't want to be brave, that don't want to be courageous. That's just our nature. Oftentimes, we don't know how to do that or how to be that, but that's what we want to be. Now, you will fall in love with the Messiah if that's what you want when you realize how this promised Messiah comes into reality. Bible says it like this. As the sun was setting, Adam fell into a deep sleep and suddenly great terror and darkness overwhelmed him. Then the Lord said, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. That's the promise. That's the pretext. But the Messiah will come to them. God says, I will judge the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will depart with many possessions. So that's the promise, Mm -hmm. that after 400 years, God is going to judge. God is going to, he's not just going to judge, but he's going to punish because, you know, after judgment is rendered, you're either going to be exonerated, some going to be exonerated, 
And some are going to be convicted. Right. And see, like when Nat Turner read the scriptures, he understood that God was going to exonerate black people who had been the slaves of white people in America. And he was going to convict and punish their white slave masters. Right. And then Nat acted. They called him crazy. But, you know, afterwards, as we talked about yesterday, they said that we now have to close every avenue by which light might enter the slave's mind. Oh. In other words, Nat Turner was enlightened. <laughs> Light is not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Light is wisdom from God. And this Messiah character, according to Scripture, he emerges very, very early in the Scripture. Kind of surprised me when I studied this because I didn't know that you got to go all the way back to Genesis. To learn about this Messiah. And it actually is in the episode of Eve and the serpent. Says that I will put enmity between you and the woman talking to the serpent. And between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now you say well how does that relate to the Messiah brother? I'm glad you asked that question. This is what they call in the, the Bible theology the proto-evangelium or the first gospel. Come on. See? It says, it has commonly been called the proto-evangelium or the first gospel because it was the original proclamation of the promise of God's plan for the whole world. It gave our first parents a glimpse of the person and mission of the one who was going to be the central figure in the unfolding drama of the redemption of the world. The quote, seed offspring mentioned in this verse became the root from which the tree of the Old Testament promise of a Messiah grew. Come on. So far from being a shrinking violet, this is a man that is expected to come who will crush the serpent. The serpent is just a symbolic name representing Satan. Now, believe it or not, in the Jewish community, they don't believe Jesus of 2,000 years ago was the Messiah. Because they know that the Messiah is not going to be crushed. He's going to be the crusher. See? His heel will crush the head of the serpent. And all the serpent would do is just bruise his heel. Right. Well, you know, when you're in battle, you may take some lumps and bumps. You might get bruised as long as you win. You're good, right? right. The word Messiah, according to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he says, Masi, says the commentator on the language, means either one who travels much or one wiped over with something such as oil. The same word as the Aramaic Messiah, which is said to mean the anointed. See, in the old days in the Middle East, you know, it was not, you know, a very pleasant place to be in terms of smells. There's a farm-based economy and, you know, you camels and donkeys and sweat and body odor and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, fragrance became a big thing in that kind of environment. Yeah. So this Messiah is fascinating to me that the connection between the Messiah and the sense of smell. See, he's anointed. He's wiped over with a perfume, a nice aromatic fragrance, a musk. So even before you see him, you smell him. Okay. Now he's contrasted against Satan that we were taught in our lessons is referred to as the skunk of the planet Earth. Hmm? Went all over the world, stinking it up. <laughs> so you have the end of the world intriguingly concluding with these two smells being in opposition. The sweet smell of the Messiah and his reign of freedom, justice, and equality and the foul stench of the skunk representing slavery, suffering, and death. Now, this Messiah, 
Did you know, beloved brother and sister, that according to the scholars of religion, there is a singular Messiah and there is a nation Messiah? You didn't know that? This is Professor Hugh Schoenfield. He says it like this. What has to be clarified and appreciated is that the Bible presents us not only with an individual Messiah, but also essentially with a Messiah collective. The Messiahship is shared. Hmm. Yeah, so you, you thought you were just coming out today for me to talk to you about the individual Messiah. No. You came today to get your assignment. You came today to learn about your role in the unfolding of a divine drama. See, that's the beautiful part that hadn't really been discussed with us, brother and sister, is that the black man and woman of America has a role in the plan of God. There is a divine overlay to our condition. You think God just have seen us suffering and going through hell and did not have something good prepared for us? I mean, it's, I'm, it's incredulous that we would think that God would favor the white European Jews that's over in Israel killing the Palestinians. You think those are God's people? Who act like that? Who do those kinds of things? I mean, surely if you were just looking at character, black folk in America would have to be the clear choice for who are God's people. Because we suffered for 400 years and we never retaliated. They're afraid of our retaliation, but you still hear us saying, well, we got to forgive. We got to find a way to love. See? Who has a more heart like God's heart than you and I? Now, all praise is due to Allah. Now, we do act crazy now. But that notwithstanding, the heart of the black man and the black woman is beautiful. Even those that you think are the so-called worst. See, when you get beyond the surface, you see the essence of a beautiful brother, a beautiful sister, that sometimes life just have so ill affected them that they have learned to adjust and to adapt to a very painful experience. See? So we have certainly, and I'm not a psychologist, but you know, they talk about maladaptive behavior. You know, because one of the criteria of living things is adaptation. You got to have growth, reproduction, be composed of cells, respond to stimuli, and be adaptable to your environment. But there's good adaptation and there's bad adaptation. So in some of us, we just not have adapted properly, but it's not us, it's the environment that we've been situated in. It's hard to be a holy man in hell. It's hard to be noble in an ignoble environment. Certainly that's our charge and that's our challenge. But God is looking at us. And I remember reading the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's writings when he said, when he was talking to us about prayer. He said that for the so-called Negro to get up at dawn to perform a dua, he said the angels in heaven rejoice. <laughs> Back to the script. <laughs> said the messiahship is shared. There's a nation messiah. The nation messiah would have to would have to be singular among the nations, set apart for the service and benefit of all peoples and as a mediator between God and man. This is your destiny, brother and sister. He says that the messianic requires us to read and study the books of Moses with a new appreciation and insight, not as something relating to a past experience which has superseded, but as something of present and future relevance 
to that ideal world economy which would come to be expressed as the kingdom of God on earth. This is Professor Schoenfield talking about Messiah according to scripture. Yes, sir. It's a man that's born from among the children of Israel, but that man has a maternal quality in nature and he gives birth to a nation of Messiah. That's right. oh. so, so we could call ourselves the nation of Islam, but we really are a nation of Messiah. That's right. mm -hmm. So don't fear coming into the ranks of the fruit of Islam or coming into the ranks of the MGT. It's a class where we learn how to be Messiah. All praises due to Allah. We learn how to go after our people and teach our people and save our people. The Bible says in Nehemiah 9 and 27, I will send saviors after them. But when you come into the nation, you learn how to love black people. That's something, isn't it? That's a learned behavior. That's a skill. You ought to give us a certificate in that. Can we get some professional development CEUs for that? Because after what was done to us, we not a people easy to love these days. But you come into the nation and you learn. And you know why the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has had the kind of, I would say, staying power, longevity, durability, steadfastness? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's because if there's a class that teaches you how to love black people, he's the headmaster of that class. <laughs> But I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> How does the nation Messiah get his start? Well, yesterday we spent some hours unpacking this powerful statement. Point number 12 of what the Muslims believe. We believe that Allah God appeared in the person of Master Fard Muhammad. July 1930, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. We believe further and lastly that Allah is God. And besides him, there is no God, and he will bring about a universal government of peace wherein we all can live in peace together. Amen. To this, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, Allah, God, came wearing three hats. Mm -hmm. One for himself, the power in which he would not reveal, and hats for two other men from the people whom whites had destroyed. Now, when I read the minister's words and thinking about this idea of a collective Messiah that the uh, Messiah scholar Hugh Schoenfield writes about, it reminded me of something in the Holy Quran. Allah says of Moses and Aaron in the Quran, so the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you as a God to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. Yes, sir. So God, Moses and Aaron, were in cooperation in freeing the enslaved children of Israel. But what really caused my antenna to stand up was when I read the 36th surah and set out to them a parable of the people of the town. When apostles came to it, when we sent to them two, they rejected them both. Then we strengthened them with a third. So they said, surely, we are sent to you. Then the people said, you are only mortals like ourselves. Nor has the beneficent revealed anything. You only lie. They said, our Lord knows that we are surely sent to you. And our duty is only a clear deliverance of the message. Now what, what town was this? They had two. Then they were strengthened with a third. Kind of sound like black people in America. See? The coming of Master Farad Muhammad, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's what it sounds like to me. No. See, I, I went to public school, so I might not have it exactly right. 
but I can read a little bit, you know. And I know that if scripture is to have any relevancy, if it's to have any power, if the word of God is to be real in your and my life, it cannot be just when we go to study history. It has to be relevant. You have to open your Bible and open your Quran and be able to draw parallels from what the scriptures say to what's going on today. Otherwise, put the scripture away. You don't need it. If it ain't relevant to our condition and we can't open the word of God and arrive at solutions for our people's problem. So I'm not concerned that some half-baked scholar coming to criticize my exegesis of Quran. Because any exegete of scripture has to approach it with his own bias, his own life experience, his own cultural nuance, the milieu of the problems of his day and time. Why would I, as a Muslim in 2024, hearken myself unto the scholarship of thousands of years ago? They didn't even have an automobile thousands of years ago. What an airplane thousands of years ago. What no internet thousands of years ago. Give me a modern day exegesis of the Quran. So, so, let me calm down. Let me calm down. See what y'all done did to me, DC. Y'all got me all riled up up here. All praise is due to Allah. 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 Due to Allah. Hmm? The promised Messiah. And I'm saying he's promised to you. See? In the church, they think the Messiah is returning. They think Jesus is returning. But they think he's coming from the cosmos. <laughs> but, you know, I give the Jewish community a lot of credit because they believe the Messiah is to be born. I remember if you ever go and get the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan magnificent series, How to Give Birth to a God. I think it's still on YouTube. Go watch it before they take it down. But at a certain point, he talks about how the Messiah is considered to be the desire of women. That's a strange phrasing, isn't it? And then the minister went on to explain, it's not a carnal desire. But in Jewish culture, young girls grow and a part of their education in Judaism is that you have to live a virtuous life, a chaste life, a moral life, because one day our people will be blessed with the birth of a Messiah and he will be born from a young Jewish mother. And so every Jewish girl has a latent hope or desire that God would choose her to give birth to the man that would save her people. So have you ever seen a Jewish version of Sexy Red? I mean, is there a Jewish Sukihana? I'm just asking. See? Because you know, there are powerful members of the Jewish community that control black music. See? And they put our little daughters and nieces twerking on a pole, acting like a sexual temptress before the world. But privately at home, they're telling their own daughters, now, you don't need to do none of that. You need to eat right, drink right, think right, be discriminating on your choice of men. They kind of give them the same kind of training the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan give our sisters. Because he ain't floating from the clouds. He's born from the womb of one of the women who suffered. See? See, suffering of a people produces the intervention of God. 
man, now the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, like the Elijah of prophecy, there are aspects to Elijah's history that coincide with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's work among us. And one of the things about Elijah in history, according to Jewish scholarship, is they say Elijah did not die. Boy, that's interesting, isn't it? Said rather he ascended to heaven in a fiery chariot. That's interesting, isn't it? Said that one day he will announce the Messiah. That's interesting, isn't it? See? The chariot of God. That ain't my subject today, but that's a good subject. The chariot of God. See? Because there's something that is in this modern UFO phenomenon that has to do with you as well. Hmm? They want you to believe that it's aliens that's visiting the earth. They hiding from you all of the people that have said that when they saw these so-called vehicles or vessels that black people were going in and out of. Them. They don't want you to know that because perchance you might realize that the knowledge of so-called UFOs has been in America for 93 years. It was given to black people in the early 1930s by Master Far Muhammad. And he gave to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad detailed information about it. All praise is due to Allah, but it's referred to in scriptural language as the chariot of God, the Merkaba in Hebrew language. Go and look it over. One great scholar, Professor Michael Lieb, he wrote a book about it called Children of Ezekiel because in the book of Ezekiel in the Bible, one of the most controversial books of the Bible, Ezekiel saw a wheel. Wheels within a wheel. Then the Bible says that Elijah went up into that whirlwind a wheel. But when Elijah went up, his cloak and his mantle, the symbol of his power and authority, fell upon his servant Elisha. Who had said that, Lord, just give me a double portion of the spirit you gave my teacher, Elijah. So Elijah prepares the way. And I thought that when I read what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said of his minister, I said, this to me seems like Elijah preparing the way for Messiah and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He says on July 30th, 1972, in the Theology of Time lecture series, this is one of the strongest preachers I have anywhere in the bounds of North America. Everywhere you hear him, listen to him. Everywhere you see him, look at him. Everywhere he advises you to go, go. Everywhere he advises you to stay from, stay from. So we are thankful to Allah for this great helper of mine, Minister Farrakhan. He's not a proud man. He's a very humble man. If he can carry you across the lake without dropping you in, he doesn't say when he gets on the other side, see what I have done? He tells you, see what Allah has done. He doesn't take it upon himself. He's a mighty fine preacher. We hear him every week, and I say continue to hear our minister Farrakhan. All praises due to Allah. You know, I've looked at that quote over the years and it grows in importance to me. Particularly because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was so wise that he could say something and move on to something else and then you had to come back after a while and realize what he dropped on you. Now, why did he say that Minister Farrakhan would put you on his shoulders, take you across the lake, but God would be responsible for having done that. See? Like he said, the minister won't say, look what I've done, but look what Allah has done. So that means that Allah would be operating in the minister Farrakhan. But he just drops that and keep right on going. And now 50 years later, we kept that. I mean, that just shows you how far in advanced 
the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was. And that's why I tell people, you, you can't think that you know everything that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew even then, much less today. Because he was like Jesus among us when Jesus said, there are many things I could teach you, but you can't bear it yet. So even in 1975, he had wisdom far in advance that he looking at our conditions like, man, I would love to give this to you, but I can't. See? But I want to bring this message to resolution by just making a consideration of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as a Messiah in our midst. Certainly you know and you'll hear a lot of people talking Black History Month about the COINTEL pro program of J. Edgar Hoover. Now Hoover put in his COINTEL pro program that he wanted to prevent the rise of a Messiah. Now why is a big time top level law enforcement official using religious terminology? in his internal memos. He didn't say a black revolutionary leader. He said a messiah. Hmm? See, our enemy knows more about us than we do. Hmm? You know, in the Quran, it says that Satan sees man from whence man sees him not. So this that you are hearing in the nation about the divine destiny of the black man and woman of America is already known by the white ruling class in America. That's what they really don't want you and my babies to learn in school. They don't want them to learn that we have a divine destiny. Now you hear them talking about this thing called replacement theory. See? Well, it's not a theory. They've been writing for years that if population trends continued at a certain date specific in American history, black people would become the majority. Without firing a shot, just keep on having babies, growing your family, you would become the majority in America. Now you and I don't know nothing about that. We just having children, living our life, not realizing that when they take the census and they study demographics, they're like, wow, the white population is contracting, but the black and the brown population is expanding. Right. See? And so they went to work, sabotaging your and my destiny. See? So Hoover knows that a Messiah is to be born among them. And he positioned himself to prevent it. That means that J. Edgar Hoover was saying that I'm going to be Pharaoh. I'm going to be Herod. See? Because it was Pharaoh and Herod's choice or plan to kill the boy babies, not just because they wanted to kill boys, but they were hoping to kill the Messiah. Right. Hmm? Kill him before he grows. Because if I allow him to grow and come to power, he will give birth to a nation of Messiah. And then he will crush our head. So the attack on black boys is real. That's right. See? They're looking for the messianic generation. They know it's you. You're fearless. You're a born warrior. You're strong. You're creative genius. See? But they keep you like a rat in a maze with hardly any positive alternatives to choose from. Thank you, thank you. And then they block Minister Farrakhan and his ministers from having complete access to you like they know we need. Right. See? You think about all of the filth and foolishness that's on the internet. Go ahead. See? Just go into your spam folder sometimes or don't. <laughs> don't go in it. Just do like I do and hit delete all. But all that is permissible in the social media space, yet the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is not permitted to have a Facebook account, an Instagram account, barely a Twitter account. Yet over and over again, reports, studies have proven that the nation of Islam is effective, the most effective group, 
in the reform of black people that there ever has been. They know that the nation of Islam is the antidote. They know it. The poison of black life in America, the antidote is the nation. So you like a people that have been bitten by a vicious serpent. And they're keeping you away from the antidote. See? It's here. Strong black manhood is here. Virtuous black womanhood is here. A proper relationship with God is here. The healthy black male family dynamic is here. The antidote is the nation. I mean, even in their so-called backhanded compliments of the nation. See? Well, you know, they like to say that, you know, the only people that really listen to Elijah Muhammad and Louis Farrakhan are people that have been to prison or was addicted to drugs or had some life of crime and violence. Well, we'll take that. See? Because, see, I told you the scriptures, if you really want them to be relevant, you have to be able to draw parallels to your day and time. See, and when they say that about us, just remember what they said about Noah in the Quran. The people didn't want to, the, the uppity people didn't want to follow Noah because they said, Noah, only the meanest of the people follow you, Noah. This was God's messenger. A man that God had raised to save them from his wrath. They said, man, Noah, I can't be with you because I just see former gang members with you. I see ex-cons with you. I don't want to be with you, Noah. You just got the meanness of the people with you. See? But they overshadowed the fact that God had raised that man for all of them and it was just those who were the so-called least of these, my brothers and sisters, who heard and believed first. Hmm? Now, do you know that Hoover said, I want to prevent the rise of a messiah? Do you know that the famous civil rights attorney, William Kunstler, before he died, he said that Minister Farrakhan fits that description today? He said, during his tenure prior to the murder of Malcolm X, Director Hoover often spoke of the need for preventing the rise in this country of what he called the black messiah. Today, Minister Farrakhan, in my opinion, would be so considered placing him in great jeopardy. Mm. Hmm? Now, for sure, this messiah character in the scripture, certain key elements to his life that we draw relevant parallels to the actual life of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. And as we go through these, I just want you to keep in mind that if Minister Farrakhan had wanted to artificially gerrymander his life's trajectory so that it would match the scriptures, he couldn't do it. Because you don't have people out here that want you to worship them. Minister Farrakhan is not one of those people. See? The minister is interested in you recognizing what God has made him into so you'll see your own divine human potential. See, hmm? God does it to one so that all of the rest will get inspired and excited and get in that same process so it can happen to them. Again, this idea of a Messiah collective or a Messiah nation. You know, brother and sister, the same way you go all over the world and they love black culture. You know, many of our artists, they go to Europe and they blow up. Because all over the world, people love our culture. They love our music. They love our talent. They love our artistic expression. Somebody sent me a video the other day. And, you know, all your life, you ain't liked your kinky hair. But they showed me some Chinese people that they didn't came up with a way to go in the beauty salon and get kinky hair. I said, my God. You didn't gave it away and other folk didn't picked it up. But 
the same way they love us in that regard, that lets you see that they will love us as those who can connect them to God. See? If we manifest our divine potential, black people in America can lead the world. That's our destiny. They follow us in foolishness. They'll follow us in righteousness. Did you know that the Messiah in the scripture, he had a controversial relationship with the Jewish leaders. Hmm? Bible in John 7 and 13 said, but no one had the courage to speak favorably about him in public for they were afraid of getting in trouble with the Jewish leaders. Wow. Look at that. A poor man, Bruce Willis, some years ago, he said, if I was black, I would be with Farrakhan, too. <laughs> Minister said, tell Mr. Willis, he ain't got to be black to be with me. There's a lot of white people that follow me. But do you know that ADL, Abraham Foxman, they sent word to Mr. Willis? Uh, you need to recant. You need to take that statement back if you want to continue to work in Hollywood. And he had to say, well, well see, you see what I, I, what I really meant to say was, you, you know, he had, he had to try to walk it back, you see. But as they say, when he would, felt free to speak his mind, see, he just honestly stated what was his heart's intent. And what's fascinating about that is when he made that statement, they were interviewing him about Bob Dole and his candidacy as Republican nominee for the office of president. And so in other words, Bruce Willis was like, I don't want to talk about Bob Dole, I want to talk about Farrakhan. <laughs> Let's think about that, brother and sister. You know they're upset now and they write all these articles about the minister's influence on celebrities. They're upset over that. See? Because they threaten and they intimidate anyone with a large audience. That's See, when your favorite rapper, because you know Minister Farrakhan is kind of like your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. Yeah. Yeah. When they take pictures with the minister and put it in their social media, they face a backlash. See, and a lot of them end up having to take it down, or they end up in some type of legal trouble, or the powers that be do something to let them know. We don't approve of you dealing with Farrakhan publicly. So the same as it was with the Messiah in John and 7 and 13, it is today with Minister Farrakhan. That ain't no coincidence. Do you know that of the Messiah, it is said, smite the shepherd, scatter the flock, Mark 14 and 27. The former leader of the ADL, Mr. Abraham Foxman, in his exit interview, they were asking him about the black community. And as he looked across the horizon, he didn't see no black leaders that he didn't control. He said that the only leadership now that exists in the black community is Louis Farrakhan, who can call out 20,000 people several times a year. They're looking at who you listen to. A concern about who you follow, who you give ear to. Because they've taken a paternalistic role in the life of black people. They fund your organizations. They control your artists and entertainers. They determine what your activist groups are going to do. And they say, well, we control all of the Negroes except for Farrakhan and the nation. So they are our chief concern. Smite the shepherd, scatter the flock, means you attack the leader so that the masses who follow the leader will be dispersed and remain disunited. They don't want to see you and I united, brother and sister. They love for us to have all these beefs. I wish somebody would get to the sisters, Nicki Minaj and Megan Thee Stallion, and encourage them behind closed doors. Let's settle this beef. See, you both have your star status, your influence, your power. 
why be two black women in the public life beefing that you will inspire other young sisters that's in high school or elementary school? Well, I'm going to blow up my beef. See? Beef and having a beef, that ain't a cool thing to celebrate. It's better to find a way to have peace. Because those that are in power over us make no mistake about it. I know you think the Democrats and the Republicans are enemies. That's the dog and the pony show. That's the song and dance. And even if they do have disagreements on certain things, when it comes to the oppression of black people, they are 100% united. So they censured the minister. I was reminded of this a few days ago when the Muslim sister Rashida Tali was censured in Congress based upon statements she made in support of the Palestinian people, her people. I said, it's interesting that everybody's up in arms over that today, but when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was speaking out for the Palestinians, and he was censured in a 95 to zero vote in the U.S. Senate in 1984, there was no outcry. Why did they censure the minister? Because he was defending Jesse Jackson. They had came against Reverend Jackson because Reverend Jackson, Reverend Jackson, pardon me, had been a friend of Yasser Arafat and the Palestinians. That's right. Come on. History, history. And it's, you know, it's not anything that should be strange to people that one suffering and oppressed people would identify with another suffering and oppressed people. The Wall Street Journal wrote an article just the other day asking the question, why are black pastors opposing Israel? See? They're upset, beloved brother and sister, because this thing ain't going the way they think it should go. And they are concerned that the old alliances that used to be, uh, they are not that way anymore. People's eyes are coming open and they're calling for a ceasefire. They're saying that we don't stand with America in the support of Israel against the Palestinians. But the minister in the nation have been in support of the Palestinians for years. Say something new for us. I can show you articles from the Muhammad Speaks days and the final call days long before this modern uptick in violence but they have attacked the minister to keep you and I divided. You know the Messiah was stoned for good works. That's something, isn't it? Man do good and you stone him. Jesus answered them in John 10 and 32 saying, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? How did the minister get into this controversy? Helping Reverend Jackson. Yeah. Now y'all know electoral politics, Nation of Islam, we're not real big on that. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he liked Adam Clayton Powell and a few other black politicians. And he said that we could get something out of politics if we were united. But we are not those who will go around and say, vote, 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 vote. We just got to vote. If we vote, all our problems will be solved. <laughs> But when Jesse Jackson ran and he asked Minister Farrakhan to help him, and the minister agreed. And certain Jewish groups did not like Reverend Jackson for his relationship with the Palestinians. The minister stood up and defended Reverend Jackson. Because, you, know? you know, I knew in the streets, you know, we had this idea of being ride or die, you know. But the Muslims are like the original ride or die, brothers and sisters. <laughs> If you are our friend, if you are our brother, you are our sister, your friends are our friends, your enemies are our enemies. So when they came against Reverend Jackson, the minister jumped to his defense. And then the Jews jumped on the minister and then Jesse left to see. <laughs> and since that time, the minister has had a controversy with leaders of this community who desire to control black life in America 
And in this excerpt, it says a group called Jews Against Jackson pledged to publicly disrupt his candidacy. Two of its members were arrested for interrupting his announcement speech on November the 3rd in Washington, D.C. A window in Jackson's New Hampshire campaign headquarters in Manchester was smashed and his campaign offices in Garden Grove, California were firebombed. Jackson's life has been threatened. And then the minister sent the brothers of the FOI to protect Reverend Jackson. See? And do you know what was being seen in all the photo ops on all of the news stations? A strong black brother running for president with all these fierce looking young black brothers protecting him. It was a heck of a scene. Because we had never seen black men willing to give their life for another black man. And do you know what, brother and sister? All praises due to Allah. Because in those days, presidential candidates were not afforded Secret Service protection. But because they didn't want that type of image being installed in the minds of black people, they quickly said, all right, Reverend Jackson, we'll give you Secret Service protection. You don't need the Muslims anymore. But just to show you, the minister was not just selling wolf tickets, as they say. He was willing to put skin in the game by assigning his male followers to protect the life of his brother, a Christian pastor. See? Now talk about a commitment to unity. The black church and the black mosque coming together. See, We ain't got time to be arguing Jesus versus Muhammad, Bible versus Quran. Let's get free first. Let's get liberation first. And then on the other side of the lake on the Minister Farrakhan's shoulders, we get to the other side. Then if we want to have the luxury of debating the finer points of one another's theological positions, then we can do that once we get free. All praises due to Allah. All praises due to Allah. So the minister said, if you harm this brother, I warn you in the name of Allah, this will be the last one you harm. Leave this servant of God alone. And it was after that, and it was because of that, they said Farrakhan is the new black Hitler. How are you going to call the man Hitler because he won't allow you to attack Reverend Jackson? He ain't said nothing about wanting to do harm to Jews. But he articulated a line drawn in the sand of which we will not allow you to cross. And that is to harm the life of a man that black America wanted to see become president. See? You know that. The Messiah in John in 7 and 15, he's a man without letters but learned. And the Jews then were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? It's amazing that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has gone up against the most powerful journalists in America. They all interviewed him for the purpose of trying to make him look stupid. They all interviewed him for the purpose of ridiculing him. They all interviewed him seeking to, before the world, prove that his ideas had no basis in fact or truth. And yet over and over again, he's victorious. Over and over again, He's victorious. And it's even all the more impressive when you consider that these were not just, you know, TV show hosts. This was the cream of the crop of journalism. I looked at their pedigree. Richard Engel, a BA from Stanford, speaks fluent Arabic. He's a Mideast bureau chief for the news network He's over. You had Phil Donahue, educated from Notre Dame, nine Emmy with Barbara Walters, 
in all of her degrees, Corky Roberts in all of her degrees. Huh? And yet Minister Farrakhan's degree is from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And they could not defeat him. They couldn't defeat him. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. I remember Tim Russett, he thought he was really going to get the minister. He imagined Sunday morning meet the press. He asked the minister, do he still believe in Yakub and the creation of the Caucasian? Oh my God. <laughs> you should go and watch that if you just want, you know, as they say in Dianetic Auditing, if you want to have a pleasure moment. Go and watch how Minister Farrakhan responded to Tim Russett. You know, when he's trying to go before work, the minister didn't come on there to talk about theology and necessarily get into an explication of the teachings. See, this was about the Million Man March and the socioeconomic political conditions of black people and the direction our people should go into. But Tim Russett went in his bag and said, oh yeah, I got you Farrakhan. Yaku, the white man is the devil. Grafted on the island of Pilon. Farrakhan, do you still believe that? The first thing the minister said, I believe every word that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches. And then he went in after that. So like the Messiah, Jesus in the scriptures, a man without letters yet learn. Where does his wisdom come from? You and I have access to that same wisdom today, beloved brother and sister. He said at the foot of his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, it's some, all of those that will surrender themselves to Elijah Muhammad become great. You think about that. This is Black History Month. You're going to go to a church, a community center on your job and watch a TV program about black history. And they're going to talk to you about some wonderful brothers and sisters. But notice who will be curiously absent from all mainstream celebrations of black history. The man that produced Malcolm X, the man that produced Muhammad Ali, the man that produced the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the man that produced Imam Arthur Dean Muhammad, the man that produced Dr. Naeem Akbar. The man that built out of black people in America a nation. A man that took the Bible and among black people made a nation of Muslims. You ain't gonna hear nothing about Elijah Muhammad. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slow down for me. I wanna say, say that again because I want the gravity of it not to be lost. Oh, a bean pie at the restaurant? <laughs> now y'all really trying to show some love here in DC. Now I ain't never taught a lecture and ate some bean pie, but I'll try if that's what y'all trying to get me to do. So if that brother bring me a slice of bean pie, I'm gonna keep teaching and keep eating. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he took the Christian Bible and made out of black people a nation of Muslims. What kind of man is that? Who does that? He made us stop eating pork, not because of what the Quran said, but because he showed us in the Bible. We started saying Muslim prayers because he was teaching us from the Bible. That's a bad man, brother and sister. That's a bad man. You know Jesus fed the multitudes, right? Well, you already know what didn't happen here in Washington, D.C. I ain't got to spend a lot of time. But the multitudes, droves by droves, by the hundreds of thousands and millions, answering the call of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And you know what's amazing about the Million Man March is that statistically, 
85% of those brothers self-identified as Christian. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now the Bible says, Jesus talking, my sheep know my voice. Another's they will not follow. Now, in churches around the country at that time, if you were around at that time, you know, many pastors were telling the brothers in their congregation, I do not want you all to go to D.C. For, with Farrakhan. Yes, yes, but something happened. And black men basically say, Rev, I don't mean no harm. <laughs> but I'm going to D.C. I'm going to be with the minister and the brothers. So if you just looked at the Million Man March by itself, it's evidence of the messianic anointing on the life of Minister Farrakhan. I mean, you gotta appreciate what happened, brother and sister. We didn't pay for the brothers to come. The minister didn't send out checks. You can go, couldn't go and sign up for no travel voucher, a meal voucher. There was no sack lunches being given out. The minister made black men give up a day of work and most black men struggling to find a job. So you know if you got one, you're trying to hold on to it. And Farrakhan said, come on a Monday. Brothers came. They paid their own way. Now how is a man an anti-Semite? They got nearly two million black men there to hear him. And you didn't report one incident of harming no Jewish person after that. He's supposed to be an anti-Semite. He's got his largest audience ever and doesn't seize the occasion to inspire them to harm the Jews. Oh, beloved brother and sister, I say you've been had. You've been took. You've been led astray. You've been run amok. You've been bamboozled. Our minister is no anti-Semite. So it was the big new Brzezinski said similar to Hoover. We want to pres preserve the present climate which inhibits the emergence from within black leadership of a person capable of exerting nationwide appeal. Well, I guess that failed, huh? Of Jesus, it said that the leaders came to him by night. Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. I drew a parallel from that to what our dear brother Nas said. Great hip hop artist, he loved the minister. But he said that one day he was at a concert listening to the group Coldplay. And as they were warming up, they had over the speakers playing Minister Farrakhan's speech. Now, this is a white group. And Nas thought within himself he felt kind of ashamed because they were courageous to play the minister, and he wasn't. Yet he loved the minister. So he said, it's like everybody's scared to speak out about what's in their heart just because they're scared of who is going to come down on them. They're scared they're going to get blacklisted. They're going to get all of their endorsements taken away from them. They're scared that they can't feed their families. So they love the minister and they go to see the minister under the cover of darkness, in a disguise to get guidance to get counsel, see? It's no coincidence. This is described as what was going on with the Messiah in the Bible, and that's the lived experience of Minister Farrakhan in modern life. He didn't conspire. This is not a contrivance, see? I know, you know, you try to say, well, you know, he's trying to make that fit, something fit. No, I ain't trying to make nothing fit. I'm making a case, like a lawyer. I'm providing facts and evidence. You the jury. You have to draw your own conclusion. But you know that a man in modern day and time, he would have to painstakingly do nothing else in life but to sit and try to make his own life fit as close as Minister Farrakhan's life fit with these scriptures. 
It's impossible. Because you got pastors and preachers on local levels that say they're apostles and prophets. But their life don't line up with the scriptures like this. Great. William Raspberry, Pulitzer Prize one. he says, Farrakhan says what so many black people believe to have learned, but black people believe but have learned not to say in public. For instance, that Jews wield tremendous influence in the news and entertainment media. So Mr. Raspberry says, the minister says out loud what most of us are afraid to say in private, but we think it, we feel it, we believe it, we know it. And you already know when our dear brother Askia Muhammad took this photo. Had he made it public, there may not have been no Obama presidency. I don't know, but maybe the Obamas ought to give the brother some type of recognition or, uh, you know, acknowledgement. See? Because had this photo, and it's already made trouble after it was revealed, but he waited eight years to make it known. Because they didn't want to see the minister in the nation with Senator Obama. They would have used that against Senator Obama. And he never would have become President Obama. See? Oh, think about the minister. He could have insisted, put the picture out, brother. See? But he's not a vain man. He's not an arrogant man. He's not seeking self-aggrandizement, see? The reason that God has elevated him is because he's been so willing to lower and humble himself. See? You seek to elevate and raise yourself, you might find God lowering you. So you have to take your place among the creatures and then God will raise you to where your gifts, skills, and talents will put you. Bible says in Matthew 21, 15 through 16, but the chief priests and scribes were indignant when they saw the wonders he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked, yes, Jesus answered. Have you never read from the mouths of children and infants you have ordained praise? In other words, the Pharisees or the Jewish leaders became upset that the youth were praising Jesus. Now, you've seen that in the life of the hip-hop artists who celebrate Minister Farrakhan. The ADL said Farrakhan received support from rappers on social media. They're upset over that because they know that young people may not listen to mom and dad, they may not listen to their school teacher or their pastor or their imam or nobody from the so-called institutions within the community, but they follow celebrities and hip hop artists. And if the rappers make the youth think Farrakhan is all right, again, if your favorite rapper's favorite rapper is none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, then, well, Minister Farrakhan is able to overcome the blockade that has been erected to his message. Do you know, beloved brother and sister, that the most censored message in America is the message of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan? Everybody in America damn near has a right to free speech. They said that the limits of free speech was that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater or you can't issue threats. But you have to include in that now you can't preach the theology of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because it's censored. It's not censored because it's falsehood or evil but is censored because of its transformative impact on black people. And they don't want to see you and I be transformed because in a transformed, noble, regal, dignified manner, they can no longer justify their evil mistreatment of us. Professor Matthias Gardell put it like this, Farrakhan has a unique capability, able to reach deeply into the souls of black youths. 
is able to talk to them in a way that really makes them listen. This rapport enables Farrakhan to criticize and redirect the structural behavior pattern. So you mean Minister Farrakhan? This is a white man that's a professor. He's not a paid apologist for the Nation of Islam. See? But a scholar who's looked at Minister Farrakhan's work. Now, do we have the question that arises, do we need someone to criticize and redirect destructive behavior patterns among black youth today? Well, if we do, and this man is saying Farrakhan has proven he can do it then Minister Farrakhan should be given time on network television to teach. Billboards should be put up with Minister Farrakhan preaching. Everywhere you look, they should be hurrying to get black youth somewhere to hear the message of Minister Farrakhan. Yet over and over again, he's being censored. Over and over again, there's a blockade. Over and over again, there's interference. See? If the students on the university, if they want to invite Brother Abdul Qadir Muhammad, they're going to have to go through something. They got to jump through some hoops. There are going to be people that said, no, we can't have Farrakhan's representative on Howard. We can't have Farrakhan's representative on Bowie State. No, that's anti Semitism. Right. And yet none of you have ever come to Muhammad's mosque number four or gone to any message delivered by Minister Farrakhan and felt like somebody was encouraging you to do harm to Jews. Right. That's right. Never. But you walk away leaving feeling good about your black self. You walk away inspired. You walk away motivated. See? Brother go home and he want to be a better husband to his wife. After hearing Minister Farrakhan and his representative. Sister go home and want to be a better wife to her husband. After hearing the minister and his representatives. The message of the nation of Islam is good for our people. And truth be told is good for all humanity beloved brother and sister. No that's real. See because the Messiah starts narrow. The Messiah starts parochial even. Jesus said first go ye only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then after he had gotten the lost sheep of the house of Israel together he said now you have a duty and a responsibility to all humanity. Of the Messiah, it is said, by his stripes, we are healed. And believe it or not, in the modern day and times, they've been involved in a crucifixion of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He's been censored in 1984. 1985, when he organized power, Long before Chris Rock did the documentary Good Hair talking about the disparity in the consumption of black hair care products and the manufacture of black hair products, Minister Farrakhan had already identified that discrepancy and said, we're going to produce our own personal care products. Because right now in the black community, the Koreans, we had to go and get our beauty care products from the Koreans. Now they don't come and get nothing from us, but we have to go to them. But when the minister was trying to get black people to become the controllers of manufacturing our personal care products, the ADL threatened George Johnson and threatened all of the other black millionaires and people who were going to help him. They said, if you work with Farrakhan, we'll end your distribution. So they didn't care that what the minister had came up with was good for us. They just say Farrakhan is anti-Semitic and any so-called Negro that we have a relationship with, if you have a relationship with the minister, we're cutting you off. Mm -hmm. They even told the president of Independence Bank of Chicago, 
I mean, this is one of the most extraordinary flexes. You want to talk about a flex? A power flex? Yes, Yo, they rolled up on a black bank in Chicago, brother and sisters, yes, sir. after the minister had deposited $5 million. Now, a lot of people talk about international trade and commerce, but the Nation of Islam had a relationship with the African nation of Libya. Muammar Gaddafi loaned Minister Farrakhan $5 million to produce these products. And when the minister went and put it, deposit in a black bank, the president told Minister Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan, I'm going to have to ask you to come and take your money out of our bank because we've been threatened. That's extraordinary. Because yes, by the mere fact that they are a black bank, you know, they, you know they are a struggling bank. Now y'all know in the black community, we, we, we do well with withdrawals. Not so much with deposits. Can you imagine how many loans that bank and how much money they could have made from our five million dollar deposit but the leaders of the jewish community told them tell farah khan to come and take his money out now that's a power flex right there beloved brothers and sisters from a people who say we have no power we're only two percent well you know your brain weighs only three pounds I don't care if you're a human being that is big as Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq's brain weighs only three pounds, but it controls his huge body. See? So you being only 2% has nothing to do with your power, your control, or your influence. Do you know, beloved brother and sister, that when they had the 30th anniversary of the March on Washington, all of the major civil rights leaders had invited the minister to come and speak, which was a wise decision on their part as event planners because it was only Minister Farrakhan who was filling stadiums and arenas, so they needed a draw. <laughs> so it made sense to have Farrakhan on the program. But Rabbi David Saperstein called Joseph Lowry and Coretta Scott King said, you know, y'all didn't get our permission to invite Farrakhan. And they were forced to disinvite the minister. In 1994, they conspired to have the daughter of Malcolm X. They entrapped her and played upon her sadness over the death of her father and used an informant to try to suggest she wanted to kill the minister. It was a trap. The minister saw through the trap, and just to show you the messianic quality of the minister. Now how many of us would find out that there was somebody supposedly trying to kill us, and then we go on the defense of that person that was supposedly trying to kill us? And then raise money for their legal defense fund. But that's what Minister Farrakhan did held a big event at the Apollo Theater in New York, raised over $200,000 for the defense of Kubila Shabazz after she had been charged with trying to take his life. See, they don't tell you these things about Minister Farrakhan. In 2008, Senator Hillary Clinton forced Senator Barack Obama to renounce and repudiate the minister See? on national TV. He tried to wiggle out of it. Said, hey, you know, the guy want to say something nice about me. I mean, let him say something nice about me. I ain't got no problem with that. And Hillary said, you didn't go far enough. See? Why is Farrakhan the litmus test? See? You want to move up in white America. They got to know you can be qualified, you can be talented, you can have the resume, you can have the works accomplished and achieved, the educational background. All right, we'll let you be VP, we'll let you be CEO, but uh, first of all, what do you think about Farrakhan? Right. Really? Well, I, you know, I just thought we were, you know, I was going to be the supervisor at the pet grooming station. What do you mean? I, I, I got I to gotta respond to what I think about Farrakhan just to do that? 
just to become the local librarian, to become the postmaster general, to become a school principal? Yes, yes. frequently positions that you wouldn't even think are powerful positions. They'll ask you, uh, yeah, I saw that guy Farrakhan on TV last night. Uh, man, he's angry, isn't he, John? Tyrone, what do you think about that guy Farrakhan? Then Tyrone has to think, damn, I love the minister, but I ain't going to get that promotion if I let them know I love the minister. <laughs> 2013, they made John Conyers repudiate the minister. And look at the heart of the minister. Not long after that, the minister went to an event honoring Reverend Conyers, and everybody was wondering what the minister would say. And the minister was so magnanimous, he said to Representative Conyers, if my brother repudiates me, he's earned the right to repudiate me. By his stripes we are healed. See? That's the Messiah, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The minister absorbs so many insults, so much disrespect, so much ingratitude, and never seeks retribution, never trades like for like. That's a Messiah if there ever was one. This great brother, Professor Andre C. Willis, he said, there's simply no black person in the world that has over so many years been as consistent, as unrestricted, and as forthright in defending the humanity of black people throughout the world against its attackers, but the minister. And we put our mayor's picture there because you know that when our mayor was in trouble, the minister came to his side. Our mayor wasn't thinking about running again to be mayor. They had crushed his spirit. They had ruined his reputation because they didn't want Chocolate City to have a chocolate mayor. They didn't give a damn what you wanted as the people of DC. See, they're paternalistic. In other words, they treat us like they are our father. But they're evil and wicked father if such there ever was one. So frequently, they aren't interested in what black people say black people want for themselves. That's why when you get the final call and you see the back page of the final call, the Muslim program. We just completed a book on the Muslim program, and one of the things that stood out in looking at it and reading it was that this is really the first time black people have forthrightly, boldly, and independently said, this is what we want without having to clear it with any powerful white people. When you have black organizations saying we want this legislation passed or that legislation passed, it's been filtered through certain white liberal institutions. Even Dr. King has Stanley Levison and other whites helping him to craft certain messages. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad represent black people free and independent of the white gaze. Hmm? The white view that would censure and tamp it down. See? When W.E. Boyce and others who were the blacks around the starting of the NAACP, they said we should work toward economic strength. But the whites in the NAACP, Joel Spingon and others, they said, you know, we just gonna pursue legislative remedies. And they pursued the path of non-economic liberalism. In other words, we can solve black people's problems by having the laws change, but we don't need to worry about money. And that's why at the end, Du Bois fell away from the NAACP when he began to see that you say this is for black people, but it's really about white people telling black people what they need. And we can speak for ourselves, we can think for ourselves. We've had this suffering and we can determine what it is that we want and what it is that we need. Come on.
Now I close this message with the personal promise. Go back to Professor Schoenfield for a moment. He says, what has to be clarified and appreciated is that the Bible represents to us not only with an individual Messiah, but also essentially with a Messiah collective. You know, beloved brother and sister, each of us who know the truth and bear witness to the truth have a duty and a responsibility. There is nobody coming from outside of our community to save us. We invite you today to consider that duty and that responsibility that's on our shoulders. As an old saying, sometimes they attribute it to Winston Churchill. I don't know if he came up with it. But it says something like this. Evil only exists when good men do nothing. I don't know about you, but I think I'm a good man. Maybe you don't think so. I think I am. My own self-concept. But I cannot really be deemed good if I see the condition of my people and I'm not actively, actively involved in remedying that condition. All praise is due to Allah. So this promised Messiah that starts with a man, as the minister said, Master Far Muhammad, he came and he wore the title Messiah. Then he kind of passed it on to the honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he passed it on to the minister. And he's now forming the Messiah in each of us. But to accept this duty and responsibility, we cannot be afraid of the challenges that are before us. The minister said this on Twitter. He said, don't you ever think that because you try to do righteousness that God shouldn't try you. This is how God knows whether you are his. He'll bring misfortune into your life and watch to see how you handle it. Some of us can only follow God if he does everything we want him to do. Let that settle in your consciousness as we conclude our message. We invite you today into the acceptance of a duty and a responsibility to be the saviors of our community that our community needs. The doors are open today for you to come and be with us in the nation of Islam. Thank you for listening. I leave you as I came before you in the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Beloved brothers and sisters, thank you so much. I am so honored and appreciative of your attendance here today. Please have a seat. I would, however, like to see, are there any brothers and sisters who may be here for their first, second, or third time? I'd like to see your hands. My brothers here, raise your hand, raise your hand. All praise is due to our Lord. For those of you who raised your hand, did you like what you heard today? Do you believe it's the truth? You think it's good for other people? Would you like to unite with us as we go to save our people? If you would, then I would like the honor and the privilege to shake your hand because if Minister Farrakhan was here, he would want to shake your hand and welcome you to the Nation of Islam. Would you allow me to shake your hand? Those of you who believe that what we share was the truth and is good for our people, would you come forward at this time? I'd like the privilege and the opportunity to shake your hand. All oh, praise is due to Allah. Come on, let's give it up one more time. Brother Student Minister Dimitri Muhammad, all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah.